All right. So, beautiful day in Southern California, don't you think? Huh? Aren't you glad you don't live in New York or New Jersey? No, it's for so many reasons, and uh, the sun shining today is uh, just one of them. You know, one of the greatest advertisements for real estate values in Southern California is the, uh, the uh, Tournament of Roses parade on uh, New Year's. I can remember growing up back east and uh, turning on the television, and the snow is piled deep, and the wind is howling, and the temperatures are frigid, and I'm looking at this thing, and I'm thinking, man, if that's not the promised land, it's got to at least be next door, right? <laughs> so... It is just a joy and a privilege to live in, in such a tremendous place of beauty. It's, you know, I mean, it's kind of spectacular, right? You've got the mountains right over my shoulder. I know that because I can see your faces, you know, looking up there sometimes. So you've got the mountains right there. You've got the, the beach less than an hour away. What more could you want? I like the mountains, I love the beach. I love to walk along the beach just to see the tide rolling in. I can sit on the dock of the bay, I mean, and, and sit there and, uh, yeah, only the older crowd knows that. I can sit there and I can just get lost in all of that. Carol and I, we, we love to go to the beach. We like to go to the marinas down there too. We'll walk around the marina and we'll, we'll look at these boats gigantic boats. They're so beautiful, and I'm so glad I don't own them. You know, they're just fun to look at. But I have a, I have a kind of a thing with boats. It's not a good thing, because I get seasick. And so these boats, they're beautiful looking, but the thought of going out into the open ocean on them is sort of terrifying to me. Not a really bad experience, uh, Quite a while ago, uh, with uh, my son and another family in this church, uh, they in- invited the two of us to go out on a night fishing boat, and uh, so uh, we did that, and I spent the whole night either baiting William's hook or making an offering to the sea goddess, <laughs> and uh, I think I lost everything I'd eaten in a week. It was bad. I wanted to die. <laughs> I just wanted to die. You know, I don't know. Maybe if you've, you're seasick, you know, you know what I'm talking about. It's, it's just terrible. We'll open your Bibles up to Matthew 8 this morning. Matthew 8, and we're going to be looking at verses 23 to 27. I've entitled this message, A Miracle at Sea. A Miracle at Sea. And we're arriving here uh, just to kind of get a lay of the land in, in uh, Matthew chapters 8 and 9. There's a, there's a series of miracles. We've talked about this. There are actually three uh, triplets, three sets of three miracles, and they're, they're spaced out by little teaching sections on discipleship. We looked at the first section of miracles a couple of weeks ago. It was the miracle of the, of the healing of the leper, then the miracle of the healing of the centurion slave. And then the final miracle there in that first triplet was the healing of Peter's mother-in-law. And then we had, a, we had a teaching on the cost of discipleship. Pastor Vince brought that to us most um, powerfully last week. We return again now to another triplet of miracles. So there's another three miracles that are given here in this section. And these miracles are brought to bear by Matthew for the specific purpose of evidencing that Jesus is the Messiah. Each and every miracle that Matthew uh, compiles together here in these two chapters is specifically designed to illustrate some aspect of Messiah's future kingdom rule. And the fact that he, he does these miracles as, is as if he's sort of pulling the curtain aside a little bit and allowing you to peek into the future and to see what the kingdom is going to be like someday. So this particular triplet of miracles demonstrates Messiah's power over nature, over demons, and over sin. So it's over nature, over demons, and over sin. And these are kingdom aspects. This morning we're going to look at verses 23 through 27, and it is the illustration of his power over nature. His power over nature. Now my outline for you this morning is a very simple one. It consists of seven words. 
I have a very simple seven-word outline, and it's designed to explain and apply this particular text about Jesus' power over nature. Okay, so seven words. And let me just go ahead and jump into this thing for the sake of time, and I'll give you the first word. The first word is context. Context. And for that, I want to direct your attention to verse 23, Matthew chapter 8. When he, that is Jesus, got into the boat, his disciples followed him. Stop right there. When he, that is Jesus, got into the boat, his disciples followed him. Jesus has, has, has talked here, and, and the way Matthew has brought this together, about the high cost of discipleship. You look back in verse 18, and it says, Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to depart to the other side of the sea. And then we're interrupted by this message about the cost of discipleship. Mark and Luke's gospel also recount this same particular miracle. And and along the way, I'm going to refer to them to add a little color to what's going on here. Mark tells us in Mark 4 and verse 35 that it's nighttime. Now it's evening when this particular event occurs. When they get into the boat and they, and they begin their journey, the day has passed. It is now evening. It's a nighttime voyage. And they are heading across the lake, literally the, the Sea of Galilee, and they are heading to the eastern shore and to the land or the territory of the Gadarenes. You see that in verse 28 where it says, when he came on the other side into the country of the Gadarenes. So they're getting into the boat it's nighttime, the evening is, has fallen, it's going to be a peaceful evening uh, boat voyage across a very placid uh, Sea of Galilee to arrive in the eastern shore in the country of the Gadarenes where the ministry will be continued. So that's sort of context as it's starting. Matthew is including this, as I say, because he wants to demonstrate something about Messiah's power and in particular Messiah's power over nature. The Old Testament is absolutely replete with with, uh, prophecy about Messiah's kingdom and the, the, the dramatic reversal of the curse. When Adam fell, when Adam took of the fruit that was forbidden to him, he plunged himself, he plunged his offspring, and he plunged this world into ruin and sin. And nature has felt the effects of that ever since. We live in a broken world, wouldn't you agree? There's all kinds of things in this world. In fact, we just saw this past week illustrations of that on the East Coast with that massive hurricane and all the tremendous damage. But the Old Testament is very clear, and there are many, many places. I'm not going to take you there, but, but even a casual reading of the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah and so forth, show you that in Messiah's kingdom, these things are reversed. Nature begins to, to perform, as it were, as God had originally intended it for it to be. The deserts will disappear. They will become productive. Floods and tornadoes and all of these sorts of things will be no longer in Messiah's kingdom. So this miracle that we're going to look at here, in which Jesus demonstrates a really stunning display of power over nature, evidences his messianic rule and gives you the glimpse of that coming kingdom. But there's more. There's more to it in the way that, that uh, Matthew has put this together because he has is, he is woven into the miracle as well something about discipleship. There's kind of a subtle message about discipleship that also flows through this miracle. There is a very real sense in which the miracle here is a test of discipleship. And I'll show you what I mean as that begins to unfold. Now, I want you to notice in verse 23 where it says they got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Take a look at the word followed. The word followed. It's interesting here because twice in the prior section, verses 19 and verse 22, we see the use of this word follow, right? Verse 19, the scribe came and said to him, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Verse 22, Jesus said to one of the scribes here, follow me and allow the dead to bury their dead. Then he got into the boat and his disciples did what? They followed him. 
They followed him. So Matthew is putting this together. He's using these words because he's communicating something. Not just a raw display of power, but he's also talking about what does it mean to follow Messiah. So the disciples are following Jesus, and they follow him into the boat for what appears to be a peaceful night cruise, and it takes them on a journey of a lifetime. It takes them to the point of death, and they learn something about what it means to follow Jesus in the most difficult place in life. And my friends, as we go through this this morning, we are going to learn something about what it means to follow Jesus as well. Now, this is the only place, only place in the Gospels where it talks about Jesus sleeping. It specifically says that Jesus slept. You see that at the end of verse 24, it says Jesus himself was asleep. It's the only place in the Gospels that speaks about Jesus sleeping. Of course, God doesn't sleep, does he? Specifically, the Old Testament tells us God doesn't sleep. It is the God-man who sleeps. It is Christ in his perfect humanity who is so fatigued that he falls asleep. Why is he so tired? What has led up to this particular event? Well, the commentators call it the long day. It is the long day. And to just give you a, a, just a hint at that, I want to, I want to turn you, and I'm going to have to turn you to the right, and you might think, well, if we're going back in time, why do we go to the right? But that has everything in the world to do with the way Matthew arranged the material in his gospel. So I'm going to take you to the right. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to take you to chapter 12 and verse 22. And I want to give you just a peek at the long day. So you understand how you've got Jesus sleeping in the boat in light of what we're about to see. So back to Matthew, or ahead but back, if you understand what I'm saying, to uh, Matthew chapter 12 and verse 22. And verse 22 through verse 37 is the the section where Jesus uh, uh, casts out a demon so you have this, this, um, this spiritual contest between Jesus and the force of darkness in which he casts out this demon, and then he is accused by the religious leaders of what is known as the unforgivable sin or the unpardonable sin, whereby they say that Jesus accomplished what he did, not by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, but by the power of Satan himself. So you have this tremendous confrontation that occurs here. It is the confrontation with the forces of evil in the spiritual realm. It is the confrontation with the forces of evil in the natural realm with regard to the leadership of Israel. If you have ever engaged in spiritual conflict, maybe, uh, maybe an intense evangelistic encounter or, or some kind of teaching uh, situation or whatever, you know it is exhausting. The combat in the spiritual realm drains physical resources. It makes one tired. So there is this confrontation here, and then it continues in chapter 12, verses 38 to 45, where they come back to him, the scribes and the Pharisees, and they want him to perform a sign. They want another sign, and Jesus says, there are no more signs for you. You'll receive no more signs other than the sign of Jonah, who was three days Three nights in the belly of the great whale, so the Son of Man shall be three days in the heart of the earth. So the only sign left for the nation, he says, is the resurrection. So there is a, there is a, a, a cutting off here at this point. The, the opposition has grown so strong against him that he turns from them. And it's, this is the day in which all that happens. We roll right into chapter 13, and we find what is called the parables of the kingdom, Here Jesus teaches a number of different parables, or teaches through parables, and it's, when we get to that I can hardly wait, but it's, these parables are designed to communicate and conceal simultaneously. So there is this draining spiritual activity that is going on here when he is is communicating, and a communicator puts everything they can into trying to get the truth across, and yet at the same time he's under this attack from religious authorities, and he's, he's being very careful in concealing and revealing in the same breath. You see at the end of, uh, of chapter 13 and verse 53... 
When Jesus had finished these parables, he departed from there. Chronologically, that now takes us back to chapter 8 and verse 18. He gets into the boat and then down to verse 23, he departs. So in terms of just chronology, as a Westerner thinks about chronology, you know, the past, the present, the future, this is what's been going on. It's the long day. He's been involved in a very long and intense spiritual struggle, and he's exhausted. He is absolutely exhausted. And so they set out in a boat across the lake. It is evening time. The lake is placid. There is a gentle breeze blowing. It looks like it's a great, going to be a great sail. And Jesus, exhausted, falls to sleep in the back of the boat. He lays down in the stern of the boat. His, his head, Mark tells us, on a cushion, perhaps covered over with some sort of a tarp or something. And he, he drifts off into a very deep sleep, a very deep sleep. He is secure in his, his trust in his heavenly Father. He, in fact, embodies what it means to be the man of wisdom who trusts in God, as illustrated in Proverbs 3, verses 24 and following, where the writer says, when you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Do not be afraid of sudden fear, nor the onslaught of the wicked when it comes. For the Lord will be your confidence, and he will keep your foot from being caught. Jesus embodies this truth. And he's fast asleep. He's fast asleep. That's your context. Now enters catastrophe. Second word, catastrophe. Verse 24, and behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being covered with the waves, but Jesus himself was asleep. Behold, just a tiny little Greek word, and it's designed to alert the reader or the hearer, that there is something dramatic about to happen. There is, there is going to be a very dramatic change. This, this idyllic scene of, of, the, of them sending off in this boat is about to be significantly disrupted. Significantly disrupted. What begins as a peaceful night journey is suddenly turned into a catastrophe at sea. A catastrophe at sea. Now, you need to know something about the Sea of Galilee to to understand what's going on here. The Sea of Galilee is located in the northern part of Israel. It's called the Sea because because Israel were primarily a a pastoral people, not a fishing people, and so this to them was, was a sea. But it's actually a freshwater lake. It's a freshwater lake. It's pear shaped. It's about 13 miles long, north to south, about 8 miles wide at its widest point, and um, it's located in what's called the Jordan Valley Rift, the Jordan Valley Rift. It It is a place where the tectonic plates move, and it is a low spot. In fact, it is the lowest spot on earth, runs down this Jordan Valley Rift. There is the Sea of Galilee, or or the lake, in the north, and then flowing down and out of it, we arrive at the Dead Sea in the south, which is actually the lowest place on earth. But the surface of the lake, and this is what's important, the surface of the lake is 680 feet below sea level. 680 feet below sea level. And it is has a surface area, just to kind of get an idea, the surface area of the lake is about 64 square miles. Big Bear Lake has a surface area of about 10 square miles, so you can get an idea. It's about six and a half times larger than Big Bear Lake, lying in this rift, in this depression, in this bowl. Because it lies down in this bowl, and then in the north is Mount Hermon with an altitude of 60 or 9,200 feet, you have a very unusual weather pattern that can be established. In the hot weather, the, the, the uh, evaporation off of the lake, it rises and, and, and flows up into the air, and it meets the cold air currents coming down off of Mount Hermon in the north. The lake is surrounded by hills that have various ravines between them, and as the cold air rushes down, 
towards the surface of the lake. It, it's compressed in the ravines and it intensifies and it hits the water at tremendous velocities. And we understand that, right? We live here in Southern California and we have Santa Ana winds. And that's essentially what happens there is they come down through the canyons, they intensify, and they're very powerful. So when the winds hit the surface of the lake, it can very quickly go from a, from a placid surface to a raging sea. A raging sea. And that's exactly what happens here. The other thing that might be uh, of interest to you is a Galilean fishing boat. What does it look like? Well, in, you're, uh, we're fortunate because in 1986, uh, some archaeologists discovered in the mud of, uh, of the Sea of Galilee a, a first century fishing vessel. First century fishing vessel, and the boat is, measures 26 and a half feet long, seven and a half feet wide, with a four and a half foot gunnel. It, could, it had a single mast, two positions, for, you know, two oar positions. It could hold, including the crew, up to 15 people. So this is the size of the vessel we're talking about that now heads out onto this lake. And when all is well, it's a more than adequate craft to get across the lake. But as we're to see here, it is a very different evening. There was a great storm, verse 24, a great storm on the sea, and the boat was being covered with the waves. It's a violent storm that hits the water here. Matthew uses an interesting word. He uses a, a Greek word, seismos, and it literally means shaking. That word is translated everywhere else in the New Testament as earthquake. So it is as if the sea begins to shake like the earth in an earthquake. Not that there was an earthquake, but that the water begins to move like you would expect in an earthquake. Mark says that it was a fierce gale of wind and that the waves are breaking over the boat. So you have the picture of this 26 and a half foot boat with just a four and a half foot side, and the waves are now swelling higher than the boat, and they're beginning to crash, and they're, and they're breaking into the boat. Luke tells us that the, that the boat is in danger of being swamped. So the, the disciples, you know, they're bailing water out of this thing as fast as they can. They're up one wave, down the next and everything around them is moving and shaking, and the waves are crashing over them, and this thing's going down. This thing's going down. This is no ordinary storm. No ordinary storm at all. And, and we can know that because, at least before these disciples, they were experienced fishermen. They are experienced fishermen. They had, a, they had a commercial fishing business on the Sea of Galilee. They know what storms are. They know how storms can suddenly arise. They've been through it. They've lived through it. They've heard the stories. And yet now, in this storm, this is unlike anything they've ever experienced. They are positive that their life is over. Their life is over. Catastrophe. Third word. Cowardice. Third word, cowardice. This is a very interesting turn of events. I use the word cowardice because that's the word that Jesus uses. It is translated uh, for us in verse 26 where he says, why are you afraid? Literally, the, the Greek word is the word cowardly. Why are you cowardly? Cowardly. What that indicates to us is, is that for these disciples... They have arrived at a, at a place where they are so terrified, they are so afraid that, that, that despair has overcome them, they have lost hope, they are positive that they are going to die, and their nerve has been broken. It has been broken. They have given in to despair, they have lost hope, and they come to him, it says, verse 25, right? They came to him and they woke him saying, save us, Lord, for we are, present tense, we are in the process of perishing. We are drowning. It's over for us. Now, I'm engaging here perhaps in a little sanctified speculation, but I would imagine that the, that the uh, members of the disciples who were, who were in the commercial fishing business, you know, Peter and Andrew and James and John, that they probably originally thought we got it. 
right? We're, we're, we've been out through this thing before, trim the sail, you know, to head into the, into the surf, or, you know, into the wave, and so forth. We can get through this thing. You guys, you bail, right? You bail, not bail out, but you bail the water out, and we'll turn the boat into the storm, and we'll be fine. So I would imagine that originally was, was kind of their approach. But it isn't long before even the experienced seamen are overcome by this thing, and they, they do not know what to do, and I don't know which one of them gets the bright idea, but the, they origi- finally they say, let's go get the carpenter, okay? So they go to the back of the boat, and they get the carpenter. He'll, he'll take care of us. And they arrive, and they, and they wake him, and they, all, and they sort of blurt out their request for him to save them. They blurt it out. Save us, Lord. We are perishing. We are perishing. Now, there's, there are some variations here between Matthew's account, Mark's account, Luke's account. In Mark chapter 4, verse 38, Mark recounts it this way. Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on a cushion, and they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Luke records it for us this way. Chapter 8 and verse 24, they came to Jesus and woke him up saying, Master, Master, we're perishing. So which is it? The answer is it's all of them. It's all of them. I mean, you know, I don't think they elected the spokesman to come, you know, okay, this is what you say. My, my picture of this thing is that, is that they, they rush the back of the boat and they wake him up and there's one person shouting this thing and another person shouting another. And they're, and they're just... They're just At the end of their lifeline, they're going to die. They're they're absolutely convinced they're going to die. And they have lost their nerve. Cowardice has overcome them. And they just call out to him. Fourth word, criticism. Criticism. This this whole account is, is just filled with unexpected turns of events. He said to them, verse 26, why are you afraid? Why are you cowardly, you men of little faith? Well, that's kind of harsh, don't you think? I mean, it seems a little harsh to me. They're going down, and, and they need him, and, and, he, and he doesn't get up, and he says, you know, I get it. Okay, all right, all right, don't worry, guys. Don't worry. Thanks for waking me up. We'll take care of this. You're not going to die. No, he, he, he criticizes them. He criticizes them. He doesn't say, it's going to be okay. I, I, it looks grim. Your circumstances are, are very, very grim right now. You're in the worst spot you've ever been in your life. You're likely going to die here, or, or at least you think you're going to die. That's not how he comes at them. Instead, what he says to them is, why are you cowardly, you men of little faith? He expects them to exercise their faith. That's really huge. He expects them to exercise their faith. Luke records it this way. Luke 8 and verse 25, Jesus says to them, where is your faith? Where is your faith? I mean, after all, Jesus is with them. Right? He, he is in the boat with them. They have seen him exercise his power as Messiah and, and do the most amazing and wondrous miracles. And yet they have lost sight of it all. But Jesus says, you should believe. Based on what you know, what you've seen, what, you, what you've read in your Old Testaments, you should believe. You should not be in this, in this situation of cowardice. You should, you should not be in this place of, of hopelessness and despair. One commentator says this, and I think, he, I think he gets it right. He says, faith chases out fear, or fear chases out faith. It's one or the other. They don't, they don't coexist. Faith chases out fear, or fear chases out faith faith. It's one or the other. And and Jesus says to them, where is your faith? It's also interesting to me, by the way, that he rebukes them before he rebukes the storm. Do you notice that? Verse 26, the rebuke comes to them first, 
Why are you cowardice, you men of little faith? Then he gets up and rebukes the storm. He goes right in the, I mean, you know, here the, hey, they're still breaking over the boat, right? The waves are still breaking over the boat, and he deals with their faith first, or lack thereof. He calls them men of little faith. Little faith men is actually one word in the Greek, and put together it means little faith men. Men of pygmy faith. Men of pygmy faith. They have faith. They have genuine faith. But it's pint size. It's, you know, a fun size. Why do they call little candy fun size? Candy bar this big is fun size, right? <laughs> but they have pygmy faith, pint sized faith. We can say they have lost sight. They have lost sight of the power and the presence of Messiah. And that failure is blameworthy. We need to understand that. That in the midst of difficulties, in the midst of hardships, to lose sight of Christ is blameworthy. It draws your Savior's rebuke. He does not come alongside you and say, uh, it's okay, I understand. Life is hard right now, and and anybody would, would lose sight of the Savior in a moment like this. That's not what he says. He says, exercise what you have been given. Exercise what you have been given. Believe on me. John MacArthur, in his commentary, he says this, and I quote, The believer who is aware of God's power and love has no reason to be afraid of anything because God both can and will take care of His children. Do we really believe that? At this moment in time, these men did not believe that. They had lost sight of the truth. Friends, knowing and trusting is not the same thing. Knowing and and trusting is not the same thing. A head full of Bible knowledge, full of orthodoxy, that that can spit it all out is wonderful. But it is not the same as trusting in the one to whom that knowledge pertains. We need to know the Savior. We need to trust the Savior. We need to trust the Savior. So he criticizes them. He rebukes them. Fifth. Fifth word, command. Command. Verse 26, second half. After rebuking them, he gets up. It says he got up. He rebukes the winds and the sea. And it became perfectly calm. Literally, a great calm occurred. Wow. Wow. Jesus stands up, looks right into the, into the force of, the, of this gale force wind, and he says, stop, peace, be still, and it stops. It becomes calm. The waves cease their turbulence. A great calm occurs, Matthew says. Now, many, many Bible teachers and commentators through the years have pointed this out, that there's really a kind of a two-fold miracle going on here, right? He rebukes the wind and it stops. But all of that energy that's contained in that sloshing bowl, right, is going back and forth. These waves are rolling out and hitting the shores and rolling back in. It takes a while for in an in a in the natural realm, for, for the waves to dissipate. I mean, you throw a rock in the, in the pond, right? It takes a while for the ripples to stop. And yet what, what Matthew's communicating to us here, and he's backed up in this by Mark and by Luke, and, and this, is the, this is the heart of the miracle. He rebukes the wind, he rebukes the waves, and it becomes placid. It becomes placid at that moment. His amazing, his amazing power through the spoken word The same spoken word that that brought creation into existence in the beginning. He speaks to the wind. He speaks 
to the storm, to the waves, and it stops. Stops. Beloved, this is, this is the power. The power in the command of Jesus, the Messiah, the King of Israel, the King of creation. And they respond, sixth word, with confusion. They respond with confusion. Verse 27. The men were amazed. They were amazed. They said, what kind of man is this? Did even the winds and the sea obey him? What kind of man is this? I mean, in verse 25, they, they call him Lord, right? Lord, save us! <laughs> you pygmy faith men. Peace, be still. Still. And then they go, ugh. All right. Mark tells us, Mark 4 and 41, they are very much afraid. They're very much afraid. All right, you engineering types. How much kinetic energy do you think there was? In 64 square miles, right, of water, violently storm-tossed, like that, the spoken word, he drains it out. It's all gone. It's dissipated. It's all in a day's work. All in a day's, not even a day's work, it's just in a moment's, you know, spoken word, Right? To him who calls into existence things that are not by his spoken word. Beloved, we are, you are face to face with the creator. Face to face with the creator. I'll tell you what, when you come face to face with the creator, it affects you. It affects you. And it affected these men. They are very much afraid. They are confused. They do not know what to make of this thing. Notice, by the way, Matthew, he, he says when the, the men were amazed. He doesn't say disciples. I think, he, I think he's contrasting here for us. The mere men with the god man, And they're terrified. They're confused. They do not know what's up. What kind of man is this? What kind of man is this? Even the winds and the sea obey him. Seventh. Conclusion. Yes, I did do it. Okay? Conclusion. Seventh word. Pastor Art told me I should have entitled this uh, Miracle on the Seven Seas. Huh? <laughs> Pretty clever. <laughs> Get the delayed reaction going, you know. I like it. <laughs> Conclusion. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? You are face to face with that question. Who is he? Listen, the answer to that question is, is just so important. It's a, it's a critical question to ask and to answer. Jesus' disciples, they don't have to worry about persecution. Jesus' disciples, they don't have to worry about disaster. What Jesus' disciples need to concern themselves with is the quality of their faith. You get that? That's the biggest issue here. The biggest issue is how is the quality of your faith? And Matthew is, is, is teaching us here through this miracle that the, the quality of our faith is directly proportional to our perception of Jesus. Directly proportional to our perception of Jesus. For he is the object of our faith. 
When you lose sight of Jesus, then your faith weakens. Do you understand that? My faith is weak today. Your vision's cloudy today. Turn your eyes on Jesus. Fix your gaze on Him. And your faith will grow strong. Make Him the first priority. The power of Christ. That's what it's all about. It's not the power of the storms. And and yeah, I'll go ahead and apply this. It's not the power of the storms of life that are going to sink you. What will sink you is if you lose sight of Christ. If your faith begins to shrivel and and shrink, it goes till it's pite-sized, right? Listen, if you're afraid of anything this morning, If you are afraid of anything this morning, it's because you're losing sight of Jesus. Your vision of Christ is is blurred, it's obscured, something's in the way. The solution to that is the gospel. It is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the reality that, that... That God has created this universe, right? It is His. He has called it into being. He has established His his law as to to how mankind is to live. And man has rebelled against that. Made a hash of both their own lives and everything they touch. And God could destroy us and be perfectly just. That's what we have coming to us. And yet God in His rich mercy does not destroy us. Instead, He sent His own Son, right? Second person of the triune Godhead stepped into space and time and took to Himself human flesh and lived and worked among us. Jesus was His name. And then He willingly offered Himself in our place as a substitute to take the penalty and the wrath of God for my sin and for yours. If you will but turn to Him by faith. And then God demonstrated His power through Christ and that He he raised Him from the dead on the third day. Amen? And He says all who will embrace Him by faith will share in His resurrection life. Citizens of the kingdom. Assured of the life to come. Beloved, what would have happened if the boat had gone down? What would have happened if every one of them had drowned? All but one would have ended up in the immediate presence of God, right? Death is not the worst thing. It is our entrance into the presence of the eternal. If fear has you this morning, turn to the gospel. Recognize a God who loves you, who loves you so much, He sent His own Son to die in your place and and has vindicated His Son through the resurrection and promises you that too. You got heaven. You got heaven. What possibly in this life could be so bad that it would overwhelm that reality? The answer is nothing. Nothing. I need you. And you need me. And we need each other. We need to be reminded regularly of this important truth. If God be for us, then Who can be against us? Answer, no one. Nothing can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, His Son. Take it to the bank. It is the anchor of your soul.
Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you this morning for the vivid reminder, the power of Christ, the authority of Christ, the magnificence of Christ, the compassion of Christ, the crucifixion of Christ and His resurrection and life everlasting that is ours through Him. May you strengthen our grip this morning on the Savior. Our Father, I know that there are many among us who who are in difficult places, whether it be health-related or or employment-related or or situations in their family or with friends, and on it goes. The difficulties of life in a very broken world. And yet, our Father, none of this can separate us from Christ, and, and none of this should make us afraid. O Lord, when the fear rises up within us, may your Spirit strengthen us and help us to remind ourselves and and bring along someone to remind us and, and use us to remind others that Christ has secured the victory. We ask it in His name.